this meeting to order because it is 6.30 and that's the time we're supposed to call it to order. Um, we're missing one city commissioner. We haven't heard from him. We expect that he will arrive shortly. Uh, so the first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the April 30th, 2019 meeting. Has everyone had an opportunity to take a look at this? Yep. Move approval. Motion Support. by Commissioner Douglas, supported by Mr. Any discussion? I think my name was. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, minutes are approved. Uh, City Commission comments. Commissioner Douglas is the only person here right now except for me. Commissioner Douglas? I got nothing. I don't either. So we will move right on to the MKSK Downtown Park presentation based on staff recommendations and the look and feel report. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is yours. Right. You're ready. Go ahead. Well, let's get to it. Um, well, it's good to be back here again, see all of you guys. Uh, we've been hard at work doing some research um, and developing some ideas that we want to share with you all today. So today um, we're going to have three different concepts. These are preliminary. We want feedback. Uh, we'll kind of go over some next steps towards the end, but we want to follow up with uh, after we get a chance to share some ideas with you and based upon your comments, we want to share some of these with the public just to get some of their input as well. So we'll talk about that. Should I? Could I have your name? Oh, sorry. Just yes. For Andy Knight with MKSK. Thank you very much. I think the last time I was right here, I was interviewing for the <laughs> project. So I'm, I'm reliving those, uh, that moment all over again. But <laughs> under under, under uh, more exciting circumstances, we've got, so we've got some okay. really exciting stuff to share with you all today. So um, again, we've got uh, Felice and Vandenbrink on the team. We've got Daly on and Primer. We've, uh, we've got uh, the engineers here. Uh, so if there are questions about anything that we've been researching, um, I'm not the only one that can speak today. So we've got our team to, to answer any questions. Um, but wanted to share with you guys quickly what we want to talk about. So some of the understanding will cover a few of the things that we talked about in the interview. Um, we've got, we also had some interaction with some of the staff. Uh, we had an ideas workshop. Um, we also began to explore the concepts. And then we, of course, have got the next steps that we want to share. Where do we go um, next? So some of the project goals that we've been developing, some of these were extracted from the, um, from the RFP. Um, that language was very important and crafted by, by you guys. Uh, so a premier open space for flexibility. Uh, we've also got a place for artistic expression, um, four season experience, um, sustainable green space with opportunities to linger, um, space that is warm and welcoming for all ages, and a timeless community park and experience for Royal Oak. So those are the things that are very high level, but as we begin to think about design uh, solutions or strategies, we filter them through this so that uh, we're making sure that we're making um, uh, the right decision. Part of our research, we began to just investigate some of the, the you know, the status quo things like the land use, uh, the surrounding buildings, the circulation that goes through and around the site, some of the existing um, projects that are currently underway, like along Troy Street and the, the streetscape renovations. Uh, we've also began looking at sun and shadow studies to find out where that begins to come across. We've got a new building that we actually added into the model to find out what that does to the, to the shadowing of the space. Um, and we've also begun crafting some recommendations too. This was er done early in the process, but the connection to the farmer's market. A lot of things are redundant and you guys know that, but we want to let you guys know that we have been looking at that and those are things that we begin thinking about so we're not designing in a vacuum. Um, so this is just a quick synopsis. I won't spend too much time. We've got a lot of content here that we want to get to, but this PDF will be available to you all to look uh, through after this presentation. Um, in the interview, we shared a few things with you that were really interesting to us about the process or about the history of, of the park um, or of the space. Um, and uh, it's still interesting to us today and things that are still motivating us. For example, the old city park that, that used to be in this, this area. Um, the Native American trails that used to cut through um, this area of, of Royal Oak. Um, it was interesting to note that um, 
because of the prairies and some of the lowlands, there were some ridges that ran through here that were sandy, and that's what all the trails would, would slice through. Um, so they kind of had these high grounds uh, that cut through the landscape, which was interesting, which we'll revisit a little bit later on. Um, also, of course, the, the Royal Oak. The, uh, the oak that you see out there is um, incorporated into all of our concepts. Um, we really wanted to, to keep that, uh, one, because it's an oak, Two, it's mature and it's going to create you know, some, sh some shade and a space uh, immediately in the park. But also there wasn't really any reason to cut it out right now, unless you guys know of another reason that we don't in terms of disease or what um, city halls or the city center is planning to do. We want to incorporate that. Can I ask, this is sure. the one that's right out here? Just right there. Right out the, the one that's got like 2,000 birds in it right now. Yeah, <laughs> the birds are there every night. We have to be very careful walking. Yeah, I've got a water and I put my hand over it just yeah. to make yes, sure. Yes, that's I was, a magnificent tree. It is. It's, it is nice, um, and we want to keep that. Maybe there's some things that we can do to kind of shape it up a little bit. I know there's some dead branches, but by and large, it's it's in good shape. Um, and what that can mean, I think I shared this during the interview as well. Just wanted to recap that um, how that can inspire um, our design, and as we get a little further into it. Um, how can we ta extract some of that uh, the, kind of the tree inspiration and, and begin to incorporate that mm -hmm. into the park? Also, the look and feel, uh, the community engagement report, uh, the input results, those are things that we also um, researched and read and understood. From that, we began to think about uh, some of the spaces. So Beacon Park was one of those projects that you guys had highlighted in there. Um, and for us, what was interesting is the central common space that was in here that was very flexible. Uh, been there to visit it a couple of times. There was a concert one day. The next day, they had volleyball nets set up. So, I mean, the flexibility of the space is, is really, really uh, um, uh, one of the highlights of the space. And plus the gardens that go around it as well and how it's programmed. The other one is Promenade Park. It's one of, um, one of MKSK's projects. What was interesting to us about this one was the series of rooms that are kind of created within the park. It doesn't necessarily have a central green space that's um, dead in the center, but the way that the space is kind of, um, um, you know, uh, divvied up for uh, for different activities to occur. For example, there could be a performance area down here while people are throwing frisbee in a room right next to it. So that was interesting to us. And then this Miller Park in Chattanooga, um, the way that they use the topography to create stairs, so by changing elevation, you get different spaces as well. And then you can use the stairs to sit on, so there's kind of embedded furnishings. Uh, within the design too. So the, those three parks um, began to inspire us in addition to those other things that we were just sharing with you that we've been researching up to this point. And so we developed three diagrams initially. Um, we wanted to, ha to have an ideas workshop with some of the staff. And uh, part of the exercise was we had these three diagrams and we said you're going to get, uh, what was it, seven minutes at the end of it I think? I think seven minutes. Uh, each group, uh, we had program pieces cut out, so all they had to end, you know, tracing paper, markers. Um, we've got some photographs of, of uh, um, how that took place and some of, the, uh, some of the results of that. But they had seven minutes for each uh, concept, each group. And at the end of that, we projected them onto the wall and, uh, and talked about them. So here's some of the, uh, we, we hosted this in the library. <clears throat> Uh, Mrs. Dumas was, was um, uh, nice enough to, to let us take over one of her uh, meeting rooms for, for the afternoon and really th rolled their sleeves up and we kind of took our, you know, our, ourselves out of the process and sort of mingled around to listen to the conversations that were being had. Um, and some of the really interesting ideas resulted out of the conversation um, and, uh, and some of the understanding about what each individual knew about the park or what they anticipated the, the park to be based upon their, um, their community engagement and, and, <clears throat> and their experience just down here in Royal Oak. So a few of the things, for example, there on the far right, there was a tilted lawn that sort of faced um, the, uh, the library, uh, really focusing on the library and having that back door really open up and embrace the park was something that was uh, really receptive. Um, 
by the group. Uh, the memorial stayed in, um, not in its exact location, but it stays in the park. Um, there are several concepts that really play that up and made it uh, much more integral to the design. Um, and that exists in, in each one of these, but also this idea of kind of sculpting and playing with the landscape um, and creating different spaces was, uh, was uh, some of the, the findings that we, we had from this process. Uh, we projected these up on the wall. Everybody got to share their ideas and kind of vet through some of the things. So we took a lot of really good notes. Uh, that began to inform how we were going to translate some of that into uh, to some design ideas. So then we took all this information back, some of the research that we did, even starting in the interview process, um, we uh, the look and feel components, looking at the land uses and all the kind of site inventory and analysis stuff that we did, uh, the workshop. We refined the diagrams. We still have the central green or the central plaza, depending on how you want to look at it, the central space, rooms, and terraces. Um, so I'll dive into the first one. The central green, um, we could take that diagram and just plop it right down and say that's it, but we've got program that influences um, what that green may end up looking like. So the series of diagrams along the bottom show how that kind of pushes and pulls that central green area uh, with the program that, that is around it. So now we get kind of this dynamic space and these dynamic spaces that are around the perimeter of that green. So we did sketches as well, just to let you know that we still do sketching in the design profession. Um, to go through a few iterations uh, quickly of what this could possibly begin to look like and just looking at some patterns. But that began to get tested with the program layout. So this is just a quick diagram. I've got some bird's eye views um, of the SketchUp model of what this central commons concept will look like. We really wanted to add trees around the perimeter. I think in the interview we stressed having um, um, a lot of tree canopy uh, down in this, uh, in this area of downtown. The aerial view that we showed in the interview had a lot of gray down here, and the green started a few blocks away. So how can this project be a catalyst for green uh, in the downtown area? Um, and then around the perimeter, you'll see a, a variety of spaces, but I want to jump to the next view where you begin to kind of see it in its third dimension. Um, I don't really have a laser pointer anyway to show you guys some of the spaces. Um, but around there, you've got water features. We've got an area that could be used for a stage. We've got several stage options, and we'll show you a few event scenarios that we've begun developing and how this could be populated and used. And there's another view kind of looking from the southeast corner. Um, but that large space in the middle in the green is kind of contiguous. It allows for those games to be played or an event to be held upon. Um, we've got, again, like I said, water features. We've got native landscapes around. We've got the memorial integrated into the space. So everything really has an address on the central green. Um, well, along with a perimeter walkway that's internal to the space so that you can walk around, kids can ride their bike, um, and you can kind of see and be seen uh, within this park area. Or you can sit at the perimeter and watch the activities going on inside the, the central green as well. So you've really got a lot of options built into it. Um, this one stays, uh, not, it's not as aggressive with the library face. Uh, and I should mention this as well, that these are all not concepts in and of themselves. There may be elements of each concept that you like that at the end really uh, promotes more of a hybrid. Um, so we're open to that, and what we want to do is, uh, you know, hear those kind of comments, the, the likes and dislikes, or, or the things that you feel like are successful in these plans. Um, we also have a restroom and pavilion facility that's there just to the right in the screen that is um, in the orange color. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, right now we've got it programmed for kind of two uh, family restrooms. Uh, we didn't specify uh, sex at this point, but we can if we need to. But it's got a canopy that projects out uh, so that you have shade. Um, and we've got some images of that that I'll show here in just a second. But a few of the event scenarios that we were looking at, for example, this one just shifts the memorial uh, to the west. Right now, it's right on axis with that back door of the library. And we want people to come out of the library and to see into this park, see into the space. So if we shift it a little bit um, to the 
west, we can create a memorial plaza there um, that could be occupied during normal days uh, and it be an extension of the park itself. Or you could have it set up with chairs and things for a ceremony that may occur there. So we really wanted to celebrate that. We also wanted to uh, create a east-west axis that connected to the farmer's market and then also to uh, Main Street so that uh, this park really was a component or extension of the farmer's market, food truck rallies, all those things that might occur there. Um, so you can begin to see how kiosks could be set up there. The sculpture is still intact, so it's, um, and there was discussion whether we rotate it, which way does the, um, the bottom face. Um, we haven't really decided that yet, and that might be a discussion to have later with you guys, but it's still there. Um, we kind of grown to appreciate it um, and think that relocating it someplace else uh, may diminish it. So how can we um, maybe not turn our backs on it and make it something that, that's really quite interesting? So um, anyway, that's a part of that east-west connection. And then a concert. Um, we've got the south... Uh, western corner as an option. It's a paved space. Right now it's not extruded as a stage, but it could be. We were thinking this is an area where the, you could pull in and, and um, put a temporary stage if you needed to, or you could just set up on the level ground. We've, we've done parks uh, where that occurs as well, but it's an area where we might have power. Maybe that uh, area has 240 volts uh, so that you could plug in all of your, um, uh, your audio equipment and lights and that kind of thing. Um, but the way that the spaces all around it really become rooms that you can watch an event and, and, um, and populate in the space. So that was the central commons. Um, the pavilion area, we're looking at a, um, and you can kind of see a couple of quick ideas there, uh, but some overlapping roofs. And it would be interesting if we could do some sort of a green uh, wall that basically was just a skin that would go around the restroom buildings. Uh, whether that's artificial or if it's real, we haven't really determined yet. Um, but the expression of it being something that's come up out of the ground uh, for us was, was quite interesting. Any questions so far? I'll, I'll keep going. We can revisit some of these things. I can click back if we have questions a little bit later on. Uh, the rooms idea. Um, so, you know, just partitioning out the spaces with rooms like you would a building. We kind of started that way. Um, and then overlaying circulation and some of the forces within the park, how people move through it, that began to kind of shape how this space began to get laid out, as you can see as the evol from the evolution of the diagrams from uh, left to right. Again, more sketching, begin to express how does this want to feel. Um, and then this scheme, while it does have a large space in the middle, we've got kind of slicing through it north to south, this kind of main promenade that could be used for kiosks and things that, of, of that nature, but, it, but it's also that kind of north-south connection, like we have an east-west connection there for that market plaza that connects to the farmer's market. Um, again, there are several rooms that populate the perimeter as well. Same program elements from the previous concept. Um, but the way they get expressed is a little bit different in this concept. And you can see here a um, little bit of the, the three-dimensional aspect of this. So we are actually extruding where a stage may go, which I'll show you here um, in just a few minutes. We're also peeling, if you remember one of those concepts from that ideas workshop, uh, there was the idea of this tilted lawn. So we're kind of creating a amphitheater-like condition, adding some topography to the space. But what we're doing is we're actually tucking in the restrooms <laughs> and the possibly concessions. You know, we'll work through the program with you guys as to what that is, but we're tucking it into the backside of the hill now. So it's almost like it's got two faces, um, which is kind of interesting. Plus, there's a perch at the top now that you get a different vantage point um, up and down the... Uh, the, the Market Plaza uh, sculpture. And so we thought that was quite interesting. Plus it's a vantage point of the park if you turn it, if you turn it around. And just, just in case you, let me see if this, that area is right there, that area kind of peels up where you can see the, the cursor. How tall would that be? Um, that's probably, I mean, floor to ceiling of that room would probably need to be around nine feet. So it's going to be like 14 feet tall or something with the, with the railing and all? 
Yeah, I mean, probably not 14. I mean, the the ceiling probably wants to be around nine, maybe the thickness of the roof slab, so it may be 10 and a half feet. Plus but it, railing. But it probably would, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, we wanted to integrate the railing into it so it wasn't an afterthought. So it's almost like there's a facade or a skin that goes around it, but that skin just extends up a little bit. So it, it creates an opportunity. Yeah. Um, that assumes that you're building up from ground level. Is there any possibility from a engineering standpoint or a design standpoint to take it a little bit below ground so that the highest elevation of it isn't quite as high? Yeah, I, we haven't really gotten into the grading, but I, I, I know what you're saying, and I think there is a way to kind of sculpt the landscape. Maybe it does move in a little bit and push down, mm -hmm. and there's a way that, uh, that we can, you know, kind of sculpt the edge so that you actually kind of walk down some ramps to get to it. You know, if this is a scheme that you guys are interested in, we'll go through several iterations of this to see how it can work out because we, you know, we don't want the fall zone uh, to be, an, an issue, and it sure. sounds like it might be a concern. We, you know, we we do want to create a safe environment, and uh, some of the things we are talking about. Which let me let me just get to a couple of the renderings of that was, um, you know, having this sort of almost like a bluff kind of look to it, um, almost maybe like the coast of, you know, kind of West Michigan, um, and you could possibly have cuttings in that wall and we've done playgrounds this way where you could literally have a grid of climbing pieces and this becomes a play element too. Um, now there's some things that come along with that like soft surfaces underneath that you know fall zones and things but I think there's a lot of opportunity here with this to, to really create something sculptural and unique. Um, I don't know of any place around that has something like this. There are some in the country but not anywhere here in the Detroit area. Um, so this would you know, definitely be kind of an interesting landmark. But the way that that would get programmed, uh, we've slid further to the east, the memorial here, again, another memorial <coughs> plaza. Um, but it's, it's not on the hill and it's not on that promenade, it's just off the promenade. Uh, so you can kind of see there how that could be staged. And it's flexible, you could have 1,000 people there or you could have 200. Uh, we've designed it so that it's intimate enough to where it doesn't seem so vast that, you know, 50 people you know, really just disappear in the space, um, just with the materials and the trees. You can also see how, you know, we're expressing the, the east-west market connection to the farmer's market uh, into downtown. And then the way that that space could open up and you could utilize that hill for vantage of the um, vantage points for any performances that may be occurring. So the last one, the terraces, um, you know, and actually that diagram is, is wrong there. Apologize. Let me just... <laughs> We were in a hurry to get this to you guys by Friday, um, and we have a diagram series that I'll update, and I will send you all as, uh, as soon as we follow. But um, it was leading to this. So um, one of the things that we felt really compelled by was the tree that's there, and if we could save that and, you know, the namesake of the, the town. The, the tree. Oh. Um, and so Haley actually came out here one day, did some rubbings on the tree with some chalk and different materials, and we overlaid those just to kind of look at the patterns to, to see what inspired us. And one of the things that was interesting is if we began to kind of draw and trace some of those lines, we could begin possibly programming some of those, uh, those ribbons that can kind of run east to west potentially. Um, so the way that we began to translate that was creating this sort of striated landscape with the commons in the middle. Um, if you remember when I mentioned that they have these high, the, the, the Native Americans used to walk through the area along these sand ridges. Um, we also have some elevated areas here that are only a few steps up, but the idea that they kind of undulate through the landscape was kind of interesting. So you can imagine cutting a section through the, the, the tree bark and, and, you know, how it has its ridges. Well, this park um, can be expressed that way as well. So we're also playing with topography there. Um, let me show a few of the views. So a few of the, uh, the, the little elevated areas I'll show you. Does 
this one impact the current, like, the butterfly garden and things at the library? Um, yeah, we had a conversation with, okay. um, with Emily, and as long as we reincorporate that into there. And, and again, these are just ideas that we're testing. If, if the up against the library is hands off, then oh, I just was uh, curious. I thought there was already space there. So what I, I didn't mention, and let me jump back just because I want to express oh, wrong direction. <laughs> um, and there are in two of these concepts. You'll see this ribbon that kind of goes around the park here. Mm -hmm. So that's somewhat like the um, the circumference or the uh, perimeter of a, of a tree. And the idea is that it's this path that, uh, that any kids can take, but um, the library kids, they have a program where they would love to bring them out into the landscape, take them on a trail, an adventure trail, so they can go through some of these landscapes. And maybe we have little signs that begin to talk about this is a butterfly garden area, this is a stormwater management area. Um, so it, it's a programmed ribbon. When it's not being used to that, it's just another, it's a trail that goes through some of the spaces, maybe some quiet areas for contemplation. So that idea can work its way into each of these schemes, but just wanted to kind of note that as a, um, you know, it's not one of the major expressions on here, but it's one of those subtleties that we, we've, um, we designed into the space. Thank you. Yeah, so this one, we've got this little elevated area. So it goes from flush, ADA accessible to an area that's about 18 inches high here, then back down to flush, then back up. So it's just little subtle undulations. Uh, people can sit on those stairs, and they can watch the activity that's happening in the green space. Uh, we've designed the green in all of these um, to host a large rentable ice rink if you um, and we, we don't have that superimposed on here I don't think I put it on yeah so you can see in the middle of that that that's um, you know an, an ice rink typical kind of conventional um, uh, ice rink that that cities can rent uh, and each of these concepts is designed for that to occur Just another um, vantage point. This one offers some opportunities for a variety of different stage setups. They all do, um, but the larger events can happen in a couple of different opportunities here. So when we were working with the group, there were a couple of areas that were of interest for, um, for performances to occur. This one's more aggressive, and the first one is up against the library. Uh, we thought it was an opportunity to really have an impact on that south face. Uh, pull a shelf out from that library so it's almost like a terrace now. Um, allow for a shade canopy to create some shade uh, so people can sit there, they can read books, they can watch, they can have a conversation, they can watch what's happening out in the park. Um, plus, the tables can be moved to the side, they can set it up with audio equipment. Now it becomes a stage for performances in the evening. Um, so it really has this kind of uh, multi-purpose built into it. Uh, the other option is at either end of that linear green space. Um, now you have a street that, or a, uh, that kind of north-south commons along the city center uh, that you can uh, use for staging, and people can populate that green space in the areas north and south. The other option is to actually put it on um, third and allow that to serve as uh, the streets get shut down here. I know for large events, uh, maybe that uh, stage area is actually set up in the street. And then everything can focus. We design the trees so that it almost kind of creates this cone so that uh, no views are obstructed um, of, of the stage, at least where the sound is, is pointing out. Um, so there's multiple options for stages within this one. But we also uh, have incorporated the um, the memorial into here. Here's, a, again, a scenario where a memorial may be set up. And, of course, east-west with a, with the farmer's market. This one allows a little bit more breathing room for the farmer's market um, or any kind of market or kiosk or setup that, that might want to occur along this kind of market plaza. And then just a few expressions. We had our architects do a few quick um, 
vignettes for each of these concepts. I think the idea here was that it was something very light, something that was um, off the shelf materials, but allowed for, and it wasn't about the structure itself, but the, the light that came down through the sunlight would create a really interesting kind of shadow pattern on the ground that would move across the space during the day. That, I think that was something that was really interesting and really interested them. So we've got the commons, we've got the rooms, and we've got the terraces. Um, those are the three schemes. I know I just threw a lot at you, and there's a lot of uh, nuances within each of the designs. Um, we'll answer some questions now if you would like them, um, or if you had uh, you know, a week or so, um, we would like some comments back before we get in front of the public. Our, our hope is is that October the 9th, there's a food truck rally. And what we want to do, because there'll be a lot of people there, is to set up a little booth or a kiosk there, set up a few boards, and have our team there to just talk to the community about some of the ideas. None of this um, is in construction documents yet. These are just ideas. Uh, but it would be good to get their feedback. Well, we're not necessarily looking for them to say pick A, B, or C. Uh, but here's some thoughts and ideas that we're starting to put together. Tell us what you think. Tell us what it needs. Um, and then we can start to develop a refined, um, a refined plan based upon that and feedback from, from you all. So questions? Questions. Mr. Dunstan. And it's just about the, the green spaces. Now, now, Beacon Park, I've been there a number of times, and the, they use artificial turf of some sort. What, what are you, do you look for using real grass, or what, what's your... Yeah, I mean, if we, and we do real grass um, in a lot of our parks. If we do, we usually recommend some type of irrigation. Um, there is sand out here so that, you know, we're not dealing with poor soils. Um, but typically with events, with people using it, you don't want to get in a condition where you have to put a little fence around it after each concert for a week to let it heal itself. Um, you know, you really want the space to be used. Um, so there is an option to use artificial grass. The thing about artificial grass is it gets really hot in the summer. Uh, it's a recycled plastic material, which for some reason it just absorbs the heat and it gets really hot. Regular turf doesn't seem to do that. Um, but There's a hybrid version too, isn't there? Where's a combination of both, I believe. That may just be where birds have dropped weeds, uh, okay. seeds in it, and weeds have grown up. Um, okay, but there, there's a bunch of different types. You know, there's the kind with... The, we have the, a lot of birds. <laughs> exactly. Right. We could just put some dirt out there, and they'll probably drop enough seeds to have you a, a, a wildflower meadow. But um, uh, there's coconut fibers. There's probably don't want the little rubber chips. Um, there's been a lot of research on children and people inhaling that stuff. Uh, but there's options out there, and there's synthetic lawn that looks like different types of grass. Um, we use a company called Sin Lawn that actually has about 12 different types from, you know, St. Augustine to bluegrass to whatever, you pick it out. Um, but those are options. It's less maintenance to, you know, per square foot. Um, synthetic lawn is, uh, or a, a real turf, is the, um, the most expensive landscape to maintain because of you know, mowing and you know, person power and gasoline, so you're dealing with you know, carbon emitting mm -hmm. things as well. But, um, but it's also a green material, so. Yeah, I, guess. Um, I noticed there isn't a water feature in any of these. Yeah, there's a water feature in, in all of them, actually. Oh, Let me, good, good oh, wait, catch. Do we have a water feature? Sort of. Is that what the, the star statue thing is? I mean. It's a little bit of a fountain. So in this one, I'm just going to carry my. In this one, um, you can see right here. It's a it's a pop up jet oh. area. Um, and in all these schemes, it's a pop up jet. What we don't want to do is what we wouldn't recommend is doing a pool. Um, there just seems to be a lot more maintenance with that, and we've seen a lot of success with pop up jets. For example, if you have a concert, um, you can shut it down and. Um, you can, you can keep it on if you'd like to, but you have the option to shut it off and then it just becomes pavement and people can walk over it. Um, 
and it's just an extension of the usable space. Mm -hmm. So, and that, this is the commons, that's where that one exists there. In the rooms, we've moved it. Terraces, it's right there. That's where we've just recommended for it to be located. There's obviously options for that to be moved, um, but we do have a water feature, and there are pop-up jets in, in each of our concepts. Now, that's kind of the active, um, this is a water feature. There's also expressions with stormwater that we can do, and we've been, you know, we haven't quite started drawing anything yet, but some of the imagery that we've been collecting um, could have a kind of a rock-lined uh, channel that water could be collected to. Then it's a dry stream bed during, you know, that kids could, could walk through uh, when it's a dry day. Um, so having that being able to be more dynamic in its personality is something that we're looking into. But um, that's just kind of a water feature when it happens. Um, we've got the pop-up jets as the kind of the water feature, the interactive component. You can put LED lights in it so it, uh, you know, participates with different events that you might have there and program that as well. And the terraces, am I missing that there's no restrooms? Yeah, this one right now, okay. we were thinking that, um, and that, that's, that is a conflict here because if you have kids and you go to a park and you've got water features, like one minute into it, they're like, I've got to go to the restroom. <laughs> so... Um, we we can add that into this. Uh, one of the things we are thinking is that since a lot of this stuff is is you know closer to the library, that the library could possibly um, be used for restroom. Um, but you know we could also build a structure out here, and it could be incorporated into this. That's that's not a deal breaker for uh, for the scheme. I don't remember if we decided that we needed restrooms because then comes the maintenance of those restrooms, right? Like we talked about that a little bit. Initially, in terms in terms of the library, or in terms no, of the in terms of adding restrooms, I think that was like one of those yeah, to be was, determined. That was yeah, that was an issue, definitely. That you know we, we were concerned about. It was part of the process. So yeah, um, your your concept, I think, in your original uh, concept here of having just a couple of um, family restrooms in within right. the pavilion, so that they would be like not separate women's or men's or whatever, but yeah, kind of unisex facilities that would be available to just about anyone would certainly save space and save maintenance over time, I would think. It's just my view. Right, and the way these can be designed, <clears throat> uh, um, Daily on a Primer have done a few in, on the Louisville Waterfront Park that it's basically concrete and um, core tin steel, and you can go in with a power washer and just spray it down. Um, and... Uh, and the way that they get locked is is pretty easy on maintenance and staff, um, so there's not you know a major issue with that. So designing it so that it's easy to maintain, um, easy to you know one of the challenges we have, uh, especially in public settings, is having the ability to lock the door inside, um, and and so having the ability that the tops may be open and so that you can hear things behind that door if you need to, um, you know, in worst case scenario. So security becomes an issue too. Mm -hmm. I would hate to have the uh, pavilion, the center of the park be known as the bathroom pavilion. <laughs> well, that's why we were trying to design something that would actually be very interesting. You know, there are lots of examples of um, these pavilion type structures that, um, they may have some of the back of house stuff within them, but the expression of them within the park makes it, you know, contributes to the overall aesthetic. I don't think this is a cinder block building. If it were that, then we'd shove it off to the side. Yeah. I think one Kyle, thing that as we, I'm sorry, Kyle had some questions. Oh. Thank you. Um, I think that you've touched on both of them. Uh, the water feature didn't jump out of me. You're saying water jet. Um, so for me, that was kind of an essential element to, uh, of, of this is having something that's, so you're saying the water jet is an aesthetic feature. It can just run and be 
pretty. Right. For um, yeah. the sound and it's the also visual. interactive, yeah. and it can be shut down so that's just pedestrian space. Yes. Okay. And you've got it in different locations. We, in each yeah, they're they're in all three schemes. I mean, to us, that's um, that's one of the major components of any urban downtown park is to have some water. Um, you know, I think in a lot of our examples uh, that that it's got water in the park. And for us, for example, Bicentennial Park that's in Columbus, they have to shut that off um, a couple times a day during the summer because it gets so populated um, and they can't handle a lot of those kids and the people. Um, so they have to shut it off and let people disperse and then they'll turn it back on later. So, I mean, it's we don't have um, a design here that is that that was a six million dollar um, water from fountain, right. but we have pop up jets here, which is equally as attractive uh, in an urban setting for kids and families. Or if you don't have a kid, you can come and watch. Uh, you can listen to the water. Uh, it's kind of an interesting sort of sound within an urban context to hear, and it's soothing as well. So I'm having a hard time I think, visualizing. So by pop up jets, you mean is there actual? A structure that is up and then down, or it's it's built into the concrete. No, so they... basically, there's uh, and there's different stone caps that you can use. We use a lot of um, like granite pavers that'll have a hole just okay. drilled into it, and the jet is underneath it, so the water just shoots up through it. Um, and the holes usually, you know, anywhere from an inch wide. It can be even thinner than that, depending on the, gotcha. the nozzle that you have. So it's either on or it's off. And when it's off, it's just pedestrian space with no obstruction. Exactly. And, right. But it can be left on at all times for an aesthetic. You can leave it on, yeah. You can, and it's, there will be a control vault or a control, you know, space maybe within this scheme. We put it in within the pavilion area. So there's, you know, some proximity that gotcha. makes sense there. Um, and you can just open up the main door, shut it off and be done. You can also do this remotely where maybe somebody here has a computer that's connected to um, a con computer in that room and you can program it with lights. You can, you can actually program it so that it, um, you know, it's not, not every jet is at the same height that it, you know, has those kind of surprise moments for kids. They stand over it and then it shoots them in the face or, or adults, whoever. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity with those pop-up jets for it to really have a personality. Well, for me, I think that given the, the limited space that we're working with here, as I know you all are, are understand, uh, that kind of multifunctional yeah. um, asset is, is, is really valuable. To, to work in here, so I think that's great. Um, secondly, you had mentioned you know working in stormwater uh, as a feature, but I'm wondering, and I know you haven't fully flushed that out yet. Are there anything? Is there anything? Um, I know we're just kind of looking at layout, but uh, green features, uh, sustainability uh, features that that you've worked in here that that you'd like to highlight or that you think we should be investigating. Um, as far as you guys investigating, I think that's that's maybe our challenge, and I think we need to start running some of those ideas by you as we begin to flush out. All those opportunities could find their, themselves into any of these concepts or a hybrid. Um, I think the goal for us is to really manage stormwater so that not a drop leaves the site if it doesn't have to, that we really embrace all of it. Um, so that's a goal for us. We also um, want to not only just uh, capture it, but is it a, a way to, that we can express how that stormwater runs from a certain area, you know, to its kind of final destination? Um, some of this may go into a, um, and what, I, what we've learned is that there is a pipe coming off of the city center building that is basically kind of just dead ended in our site. So I think that we may be absorbing some of the. Um, the rainwater from this project, which is fine. Uh, that's what green spaces are for. Sure. Uh, so we're looking at opportunities to um, not only take that rainwater, but the rain that's on our site. And if there's opportunity, I know that there's not a lot of green infrastructure on the streets that surrounds our property, but if there's a way for us to maybe create a couple of little channels where some of that water can come into the site. You notice on each of our schemes, we've got green space around the entire perimeter, and those are prime candidates for some rainwater expression. You know, I hesitate to say rain gardens because I think that there's um, a lot of kind of poor examples of how those have been done. Um, 
But what we want to do is create a landscape that is more porous and soft, that allows the water to soak in. Um, we may have to depress some of those areas a little bit so that it can hold a volume if it needs to, but ultimately it can go down into a um, possibly a chamber structure that might be where this building or the building next door, their basements are. Um, so we're retaining, and then we've got sand underneath um, for quite a depth. What's how, how About what? 12 and a half feet. We've right. got plenty of drainable soil here, so if that water gets into those chambers underground, it's going to eventually percolate out and, um, you know, take a lot of load off of the storm system around here. That's great. I would really urge you to be creative in that space and, and, and think about how we can work that in. One of, the, one of the greatest public benefits of this project, in addition to there being a gathering space in our city center, is that we're turning concrete into green space. Yeah. And we want to maximize that value by putting as much water back into the ground where it belongs as possible. So, and to the extent that that can add to the aesthetic of the park, right? Um, that's I think something I'd be really excited about. I think the community would be really excited about. Yeah, and 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 one of those schemes that's it's this one, you know, we had said initially that that center space could be a plaza and it becomes more European or it becomes more civic, but I think we at the end decided it needed to be green. It needed to be porous. Um, and we didn't want to rely on porous pavers because a lot of times that becomes a maintenance issue as well. Um, so uh, having the open lawn area, synthetic lawn can also be porous. You can drain that well, so that's not an issue. Um, so I, I agree with you. Having the sponge of a site is a positive thing and a goal for us. Thanks. Commissioner Douglas. So I have three sort of unrelated questions, observations. One is, and maybe this is directed toward our staff, I had heard uh, speculation at one point about putting uh, more substantial public restrooms into the southwest corner of the farmer's market. Not that that's you know, immediately on site, but when you got to go, you might be willing to cross the street to use that. Um, is that in the realm of possibility here, especially for a scenario, one of the scenarios where you did not incorporate restrooms? Yeah, and I'll let Greg speak if he's got um, a response to that. But we we don't necessarily have to have restrooms here. I think it's more of a this is a best case scenario. Um, if you you know, and I imagine you know we've all been to the park with kids or have seen park kids at the park, but it, it it's inevitable they've always got to run in the restroom. And right as you've gotten all your stuff unpacked. And, um, and if it's across the street, that means you got to repack and you've got to go across the street because um, you don't want to leave all your stuff there. So it, part of it's just convenience. Um, I, I do believe that there are some restrooms within the farmer's market, and uh, we had some discussions with her, and I think that they may be possibly... There's plans for some, I believe. Yeah, there's also... The market would like for that to happen in the southwest corner, and their thought process was market manager thought process was is that if we could dual purpose them possibly we could use park funding to help fund something added to the market and dual purpose the restrooms as Andy pointed out the convenience and the distance I don't know how that figures into the uh, the usability of the restrooms as Andy said for families using the park my concern is that we, you know, when you got to go, you got to go, and people wind up going into the commercial office building there looking for public restrooms. Um, the library is another option, but their facilities are small and not necessarily geared for the amount of traffic that we hope to have in the park. So, I mean, I, I sort of think, you know, the, the loo is going to be a, a crucial part of our decision here. Um, so that was my one question, one comment. My second comment is, and you mentioned this in passing um, at the beginning of your what you said, and I've been observing it as this building next to us is going up, and that is that um, there's going to be a lot of shade in this park. And is that conducive to real grass even? Yeah, let me go back to that diagram. Um, we actually have one of the – it's a winter evening you can see it there. Let me try and zoom in. So that 
image right there is about the worst condition that we're going to get from the top, a top left, the lavender. The the lavender, yeah. So the um, the purple. Well, there's two. There's a summer, and then there's a winter, and um, the uh, winter is the dark gray, and the summer is the purple. But either either way, it gets about a quarter into our site. Now, after that, it's basically nighttime, so it's not really affecting the um, the sun on the okay. the grass that it needs to grow. And there's some other shadows here, just to kind of give you an idea. So I think this one on the right's noon, and then there's morning uh, to the left there. So we did study that, and um, <coughs> it doesn't have a whole lot of impact on us. The the one um, I don't it's not a concern yet, but it's something just to observe is um, what that shadow may do to this tree right here. If it's going to change the character of that at all, because mm -hmm. um, that does fall within the late afternoon shade. But there's plenty of sh uh, sunlight up until, you know, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. So um, here's my third question, and, and I'll say that, that travel broadens one. Um, so um, I, my observation is that there isn't a public space, park, plaza, or node in Europe that doesn't have a restaurant. Um, have we taken this into consideration, the opportunities? I mean, people want to sit and dine and have a drink and look out over the park. Mm -hmm. um, and this hasn't really been necessarily a part of our discussions either, um, but it seems that it would, I think, I mean, that's an important part of, of you know, life in a park. You use Beacon... Beacon, Beacon, Park, Beacon park as an example. Um, and they've got a cool restaurant with outdoor seating. Yeah, and there's a few different ways. And it, if we have the opportunity to integrate food and space, like cafe-like, within a park, we think it's a it's a positive addition, especially in an area that's kind of surrounded by more civic uses. Um, now, Main Street is a block away, so you have your options there. Um, some of the concern may be that it's competition against um, those uh, those business owners. Um, but having a restaurant in an area or maybe a cafe, or it could be a pavilion that could be leased out to different tenants. Um, like that project I mentioned, Bicentennial Park in Columbus, it was intended to be just a summer fall venue, but it was so successful that we had somebody sign uh, like a two-year lease for that um, to run be run year-round. So it could be a very nice addition um, to the park, and it doesn't have to be that big. It, it You don't even really have to put kitchen things in there. It can be more um, banquet style where they bring their own stuff in for the day, like a kind of a, like a food truck kind of experience. And it, I mean, when we looked at, uh, when we considered the designs of the office building that's going in there, I mean, the preliminary, the preliminary sketches showed perhaps an eating and drinking establishment um, at the sort of south, the south end of that. Um, so, you know, we might be wanting to talk to the developers and see how that plan has advanced. That would be a great thing for the, this park. <laughs> um, you know, and it, we promote mixed-use opportunities um, and every opportunity that, that we, we do, we do a lot of urban design and planning as well, in addition to landscape architecture. Um, and especially on it, when it fronts a public amenity like this, having one or two options, even if it's a coffee shop that is, uh, that has a, um, you know, a few hundred square feet within that space is going to help out tremendously. Yeah. That's all. Any other questions? I have Last tons, time. but I just can't think of them right now. <clears throat> well, it, what? I'm sorry. Did you have a question? No. no, I said I have. I think I have a lot of them. I just am, like so many thoughts going through my head right now. Well, this isn't your only opportunity. What it will be like to do is have this be the start of a you know just a little bit of a dialogue between us and, and you guys. Um, so, if you want to filter stuff through Greg or your 
uh, more than welcome to email things directly to us. We want to kind of tabulate some of the thoughts that you guys have or the feedback. Um, we're going to couple that with, um, and if we have your blessing, we'd love to take a f just a few of these exhibits to that uh, food truck rally to share, to get some feedback. Um, and then we'll kind of take all of that and determine what that means. Where do we move forward from there? And, and then looking beyond that, develop a preferred concept where we would come back in front of you guys with, with not sketch up models and, you know, cartoony diagrams, but actually renderings and um, animations and things. So you can actually get down in the space and see what it feels like. And this will be on, this PowerPoint will be on the city website, Greg? Yes, we'll get it. Okay. Can you send us a copy of it? Will they send us a copy? A hard copy? Hard copy, like a PDF. D d There's a PDF on here right now. Um, could print it out if we wanted to from the PDF. I'll I'll update that one diagram and get that to Greg um, this this evening, and then he can send you guys the kind of the, it's just about thirty four megabytes. I can do a lower resolution if you want something a little bit more easy to to email back and forth. You want to see the pop up jets, the Detroit Riverfront in front of the GM building? Oh yeah, I've been there. Yeah, yeah that's a good example. I was thinking of like how it works. Cool. There's a there's a pop up. There are a series of pop-ups in a park in Stratford, Ontario, and it's a small, small little, all just concrete or, or brick paver type uh, plaza area behind their city hall, and they have their pop-up jets timed so that they're not going constantly. They only pop up like once every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes, so that gives the opportunity to kind of disperse yeah. in between the pop-ups so it doesn't get quite as crowded on that tiny little space. So there's ways to time that kind of stuff, too. It's yeah, when we get a little bit further, we'll get um, those water feature consultants on board, and they'll be able to help program, figure out, ex and they've got experience all over the country, you know, how do other communities do it. Is Miller Park similar size into what our park will be? Like, just looking at this rendering, it looks like it is. I'm just curious. Yeah, and that's more of a kind of a trapezoid. Um, so... Okay. It pinches back there, and they have a kind of a pavilion space in the back as well. I'm not sure if there's a restaurant there. I, I'm assuming that there is, but that kind of comes to a point back there. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit how you thought about the Star Dream? And in most of these cases, it seems like you decided it wasn't an important feature from the center of the park. Well, the, there's the east-west connection that we're really trying to play up in each, each one of these schemes. For example, you know, this market day, right. which could occur as often as you wanted it to. It becomes a central feature within that. Um, it, does it find itself in the middle of the park? It doesn't. No. Um, and one of the things we were concerned about is if we started to disassemble it, um, you know, what are the unknowns there? What? pieces break you know we don't really have contact with the artist so we're afraid to kind of move that without just dis disturbing you know their their work or the integrity of the work um, we did think about maybe removing the little low walls that were around it and putting the pop-up jets around it um, but that seemed to move the water feature you know into the middle of the market day when if you're ever in market you want possibility for kids to play people to play in the water feature and have it running so um, we didn't want to shut that down during during a market day there's a couple of things that I recall from being here when that was installed I'm probably the only one here that was um, first of all my recollection is that the location was picked because the artist wanted not only an east-west orientation but he didn't want the figures to face a building. He wanted them to face an open space. So that meant that they had to face between the buildings. Now, granted, he could not foresee that perhaps in the future some building might go on 2nd Street. But on the other right. hand, at the time, it was very important for him to be able to place his figures so that when they faced in that direction, they were facing open space and not the back of a building. So if you're thinking, if anyone is ever thinking about relocating it, you might want to keep that in mind. 
that at least originally when he designed the location as well as the sculpture, that's, that's who he was concerned about. The other thing to keep in mind is that the plaza that is around it is, is a component of it, and it was you know, added a little bit later um, with a lot of fundraising so that there would be a protected area around mm -hmm. the sculpture as well as an area for people to sit um, and maybe, you know, kids, they can kneel on it and maybe, you know, touch their hand in the water type thing. But funds were raised for that plaza that is around it, the marble, whatever they are. Is. So, um, it, Do you I know think if there's any historical documentation about, <coughs> about those kind of stories? Because... You know, if we do anything, you'd like to be informed. They had a program at the library on it about a year ago, year and a half ago. So there is. Yeah, there is. There is. It's not that long ago, obviously. So that there's got to be some historical documentation that should be readily available to you, um, not only the from the library presentation, but just from Judy David's um, uh, archives and so on and so forth. So. I think it would be helpful for you to have all of that so that you would understand the, the more broader history and story behind that, behind that sculpture. Yeah, I mean, there's something sort of romantic about, you know, the, the sculpture itself and then the, the circular pool that's around it. Mm -hmm. um, that, that now that it's there, I don't know if, if we would have done a pool around it, but it's there. And, you know, you can imagine some movable chairs uh, like Bryant Park that are around it could be colorful chairs and then now all of a sudden you've made it kind of a central you know almost like a European kind of fountain in a plaza. When it in the summertime when the fountain is on and especially when it's a little bit windy it's a very popular spot for families mm -hmm. because it acts as a splash fountain. Right. The kids will move around depending upon the way the water goes the way the wind blows it and it's we, we don't actually call it a splash <coughs> park but we actually have one on some windy days during the summer, and it's a very popular feature. So it's more than just, you know, a sculpture with water fountains in it. It's, there's more aspects to it. Um, not only the way it was designed and built, but also the way it operates now. Yeah. Kind of the happy accident kind of thing is, you know, in addition to the sculpture itself. Okay, is there, go ahead. Is there anything that needs to be done from an entrance perspective? I know that was something we talked about at one point from between the buildings of having some kind of entryway into the park. Is there a formal entryway? No, I don't know if it's formal or not. It was but I just remember that was there was a reason that we needed to have the design done by a specific time, I thought, because of what else was going on around because there was was that am I thinking of the wrong thing? But the connectivity? <clears throat> is that I think the Henry Ford building was <coughs> contemplating some kind of connection to the parking structure. Okay. Is that what you're thinking of? I don't know. I just I remember we needed them done because there was integrations with the buildings that were going around. I think what you're thinking of is what Tim just mentioned. Okay. That they were thinking at one time, and I don't know if they still are. They, no, they're saying okay. no. Perfect. That there was going to be an actual physical connection between <coughs> Structure and that is no longer going to happen. It's no longer being okay. Okay. I just felt like there was. Thank you. Okay. I wish I could bring up a point, and you know, there's lots of layers to this that, um, as we discuss it, it, it kind of, you know, um, prompts me to, to bring it up. But uh, signage and wayfinding, that's another layer that will work its way into this uh, to this exercise at some point. Um, like, for example, on this, you could imagine as you're walking from west to east towards the farmer's market, that face of that wall could have some big letters on it that say, you know, Royal Oak Commons or whatever, um, you know, whatever the branding may be, which is another exercise that we want to get into once we begin to develop the preferred concept is kind of branding this space as well. Kyle. Hi. Um, so I guess I, I just wanted to think on the, the Star Dream more. I thought that was an interesting observation because my, my feeling was that it, it felt like the gateway from the west, if you're entering the park from the west, that it is kind of in a respectful position. And I want to make sure that we're doing that, even though it's not central to the park, it's a central feature as you enter from Main Street. 
Um, whereas right now you're entering from a sea of parking. Now you'll be it'll be funneling you into the rest of the park and opening the park right. up to you. And and also a, a critical feature of the connection from Main Street to the farmers market. Um, and I want to make sure in the final design that it feels like it's not tacked on or just there because that's where it was. But it's it's an inviting essential feature of the park. Yeah, and maybe there's some colorful uplighting or because it is a. A, a very tall structure and as you're walking from east to west or west to east it could be lit up in a way where it's something that's kind of a beacon in the landscape too um, so I think there are some ways that we could really integrate it and keep it um, in its current condition that's a good point yeah, so apropos of that, um, I will say that of your three concepts, the one, uh, is it the, the rooms one, the one with that, that concession structure there by the, um, uh, the western entrance is my least favorite only because it takes one of the quadrants of the park and instead of people walking in and immediately <coughs> encountering green, they walk in and immediately counter more concrete and maybe don't even know that there's a park there. So so of the, the ideas that you proposed, I would say that's my mm -hmm. least favorite. Yeah, that's fair. That's, that's a good point. It really becomes reliant upon that architecture to continue to pull you in, which it can do. Um, but if you want the expression to be green, um, that's not what you're saying. Yeah. Right. That's my least favorite as well. As well, and I haven't thought about the concrete issue, which is which is absolutely accurate. But the the height, the additional height of the um, the the perimeter areas, I, I'm just not. There is so much other height in that area with buildings and so on. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I just having, uh, just from my own f personal feelings, just having something more level. Yeah, and don't feel bad to say, I mean, that's exactly the kind of feedback that we need. Um, we like all three schemes right now, so we have other options as well. And, um, you know, we, we want that feedback. And while this could be a really interesting expression, um, there are other options, and there are other real, two other great schemes, and there's other elements about this that's, that's great, too. So, you know, as you guys begin looking at this, you may find yourself saying, I like A, B, and C out of this one, but I really like, you know, D and E off of this one, and what if we could start to, you know, see a hybrid of the three different schemes? So there may be elements of this that you do like, so you don't throw the whole thing out. You just say, you know, big X on that thing. Let's but let's not throw some of these things out. I do like the one that incorporates the library. Like, I feel like bringing the library into it helps to create even more, like, make it even seem bigger than it actually is. Mm -hmm. So I do really appreciate this one from that perspective. That's the, That would be the third option that you... Yeah, I think that, like, that yeah. adding that element to the library is really positive in my opinion and right now the library has the only mature trees outside of this one in the block yeah mm -hmm. i guess i'd be concerned if this means removing trees but we can well, have that we, conversation later. we mentioned this um <laughs> to uh, Ms. moss and she was like you know what if we could make something really special of the back where people really wanted to engage with it and we talked to her about you know this kind of terrace idea and she's like that's that's it we actually drop that seed in our ideas workshop and a few people were like I'm going to do that right now in the scheme so there's a lot of kind of interest and in, um, momentum uh, at least within the design team right now to do something a little bit more aggressive behind the library um, so whether it's this or a variation of it um, we're very much behind that if, if that's something you guys want us to keep pressing on <coughs> One of the three is more conducive to that space, or do you think all three of your designs are equally? Because I mean, you presented them all very neutrally, like this is not better than that. But do you think that yeah. one of these concepts is probably more conducive to the space we have? I think that they each kind of respond in their own different ways. Um, are you asking if I have a, a favorite? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
And I, I think there's 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 a lot of narrative behind the terraces. Um, you know, the original inspiration was taking some of the cues from the look and feel and trying to take a few of the parks that made its way into that document. They weren't just by accident. There was some positive reception behind them. So we wanted to kind of start with the structure of those because there's only a certain amount of typologies for an open space within an urban context. Um, you know, the central, central space where you divide it into a bunch of smaller spaces. Um, this to us was a little bit unique um, in that, you know, the terraces notion, which started with the idea of the finished floor of the library is quite a bit higher than the park and being able to work our way down to the park level and kind of extending that expression north-south. Um, then the idea of, you know, the tree and rubbing off the physical tree that's right here in the park now that we want to save, that the geometry of the park is a derivative from that tree. Um, and then the way that we use kind of the native trails with the ridges that are up higher with the lower areas, which could be the um, where we deal with stormwater, whether it's permeable paving or the open lawn, those areas can get wet and eventually so the water soaks in, but you can stay dry up on those on those ridges. So there's a lot of narrative and possible branding within that one. Um, you know, so for me, there's a lot to explore in that concept. And I think that would be uh, really unique for, for Royal Oak. I think your undeclared favorite is probably my undeclared favorite. I mean, if we can decide now, then it's easier. But what I want to do is, you know, it's all hit you guys really quick right now. Um, and so we want to make sure that we really think through this process. Um, not let it linger on too much, but, you know, because we want to keep going. Um, but do take a look, provide us feedback, and, you know, we'll keep working. We'll keep pushing forward. Any other comments? Yeah, I just want a chance to go stand on, on each of those sides of it with a picture in front of me and kind of close my eyes and try to imagine and visualize what that might look like. And we do have the ability, and we haven't gotten to that point yet, we were debating whether or not we took eye level shots and shared those with you, but the materials right now and the, the details, it would look really sparse. Um, so with this view, the composition kind of shares a lot. But as we begin to develop the idea more, we'll start to put textures on the grounds. We'll show leaves in the trees and colors of foliage. We'll show the water, um, you know, moving. We've got, you know, programs that, that can do that for us. So as we refine some of the, the program and the, how they're shuffled and the geometry of this, we'll begin to, you know, fill in the gaps. And the next time that we come to present to you guys, We've got Google Glasses. You can stand in the middle of the space and oh. look around. We can do an animation. We want to make sure that, and we do that as well because, um, you know, I skipped over the plan view. You rarely see a park from an airplane. You really experience the park being down in it. Now, some of the people in the city center may look at it from a vantage point, but it's, it's not from up above. So we quickly get past that programming and distributing square footage, and we get into what's it like to be in the park. Any other comments at this point? I'm getting the sense from the group that, for the most part, they're comfortable with these three concepts. They don't want you to throw them out and, and start all over. Is that accurate? OK. OK, good. So what you need? <laughs> <laughs> OK, good. OK. So I guess from this point forward, what you need us to do, and for anyone from the public who will see this, um, is to, over the next week or two, look more closely at them and get back to you with additional comments. And That's then right. you're planning on going to the market on the ninth. Does anyone have any objections to them going to the market on the ninth with these three concepts? We think it's a great idea. Um, and then... And we'll put big labels on them, conceptual ideas. You know, if there's... Uh, these are not written in stone yet. Right. Yeah, I think as long as you make it clear that it's still kind of an open process, um, that it's unlikely that we're going to th throw anything out and start from scratch, throw them all out. But basically, there's a lot of opportunity for um, mixing and matching and moving and adding and subtracting based on these three basic design concepts. How are you going to collect feedback <coughs> from the public at this event? 
Well, we will be, we plan to be there. And if, and if anybody would like to join us, they're more than welcome to. Um, and we'll have comment cards. People can, uh, we, a lot of times we have these pins that you can write something on and stick it on something that you may um, either have excitement about or concern. Um, we've also done where we have cards that are like a little chalkboard that they can write something on that they liked about it and then they, they, they take a picture with it. There's a lot of different ways. Um, now we know that this event's not about us. It's about the food truck rally. So we're going to try to keep it, you know, um, kind of off to the side, but there'll be a lot of people there that we can really get a lot of feedback from. So we'll take lots of notes and, um, you know. And, that. and what we'd like to do is, with that information, with your information and feedback, is develop a preferred and then get back in front of the community again to say, you know, here's what we heard from you, um, and this is, this is where we are with the park, with the design. And Judy, we can publicize the food truck rally and this aspect of it as much as you do the rest of the, the meetings and so on relating to this issue? Sure, of course. Okay. Is this live broadcast? If anybody's out there watching, October the 9th at the food truck rally. We want to see you there. Hopefully it'll be a decent weather night. Okay, any other comments from the group right now? Anything else you need from us at this point? I think, I think I'm good on our end. Just feedback from you all. Okay. Well, that's our homework, is to between now and the next week or two is to seriously look at these again and give any other feedback that you've got. And then anyone else that's out there that has feedback, you know, we're welcoming any comments whatsoever. So. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. This was terrific. This is exciting. Uh-huh. We're excited. Yes, Okay, that moves us to the public comments section of the meeting. If there are members of the public out there that have any comments on anything related to this topic or really anything at all, this would be the opportunity for you to come forward. You've got about three minutes of time um, or less, depending upon what you want to say. Mr. Witz is here. Um, do I come up here? Or you, right there. Just give us your name. Uh, John Witz. Um, so I just, uh, I participated in the, some of the planning processes, and I, I just was thoroughly over, just over the top impressed with what I just saw. And uh, just a couple comments, um, or a question to start, if I could. The question I have is, you said renting a skating rink. Were there thoughts to create the green space in a way that you could put the water above it um, and create an engineering system that was permanent versus the idea of renting a space each year? Is that thought come in? That was the first question I had, like Campus Marshes does, or is that cost prohibitive? Because certainly, you know, just uh, from a comment perspective, the idea of seeing the park utilized more than, you know, the three, five months, six months, you know, that I think that's just a, a really important play that would lead to great stuff. So I guess I would want to see if I could just hold my time for a second and have that question answered. Is that possible? Sure. sure. Yeah, we've, um, we've done both directions. Usually if you have a built-in um, ice skating rink, it's on a paved surface because um, you, you, you do have drains and you got to let uh, you have to have an area for the water to freeze um, and it does take up uh, a fairly large space you know there is a, uh, a skating rink that's in downtown Grand Rapids I think Mylin designed that um, like Rosa Parks I believe is next to the, the um, art museum there um, and it's all paved um, so during the day, it becomes a staged area, but it's really hot, too, um, uh, on a 95-degree day. So it also, um, once you build that infrastructure in there, it's in there for good, even if you decide later on that you, you don't want it anymore. So just, to, just in response, I think Campus Martius does put a turf 
over there. Is anyone familiar? I don't think it's I don't think it's paved. It is not. It is not. Yeah, and I think so. I think the turf comes out and then the water goes in. <laughs> so I think you can avoid the okay. heat cement thing. So you could have grass everywhere and then use that little bit of turf. And the rink at Campus Marshes is fairly small, and, and it just demonstrates that you don't need a big rink. So if you're thinking about renting a rink, I just think that you can commit to a feature that adds some texture. You know, you could put, you could have a, a cover that could create a flat space for large events, and then, uh, I mean, you could have turf in the summer and then have a cover mm -hmm. that would go across uh, for events or just have the grass built up. I'm almost sure it's grass. Uh, it's definitely grass. I mean, yes. I work and I test every day. It, I'm trying to remember how they build it out because I see it every day. But they assemble it all on top of the grass, right? Absolutely. So the ones that are integrated, you just fill it with water and then that freezes. We're not talking about that. We're actually, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a rentable one or you guys own the stuff. Whichever way, the idea is that um, you assemble it. <laughs> yeah, I looked into running them. They're pretty. They're, I mean, looked into running them specifically for doing a winter event in Royal Oak. So I mean, they're they're decently expensive for you know six eight week period you know over time. So I just throwing that out there. But that's yeah, I that's just a thought. Something to research. I think we need to look a little bit more into like how that how that occurs. And I could definitely connect you with the folks at the you know, Detroit, downtown Detroit partnership to at least hear about what they do too, because I think that that idea is, uh, you know, very viable. So anyway, thank you for the answer to that. Just a couple more um, uh, quick Excuse me. comments. Um, I, the, the texture that's incorporated in some areas I think is key and great when you guys do raise levels a little bit and still keep an open space. It just, so many nice options in a way that doesn't upset uh, the idea to have the space flexible and large. I do think the food answer, just with, I just want to comment on that, that I think the food answer, because of the limited amount of space in the park, is to utilize uh, local restaurants around as the food option, but have the park be a great spot to host weekly food truck visits. So you could create your own cafe without taking up the space at the at right times and do rotating trucks and restaurant features and themes of food, you know, nightly, weekly, uh, whatever. And I, I mean, I have a lot more other thoughts, but I wanted to ask the, the winter question there and just give a couple of comments and just to say from participating in the process that you guys rock the house on these that I've seen and just from someone who's, you know, seen the pop-up jets at, at GM Winter Garden and watch them interact with both festivals and in general. I've seen those in operation for River Days and how they create an activity within a festival during the day. For example, if Arts Beats and Eats moved a stage there, you could still have daytime stuff going on before the shows and create some family stuff and incorporate the jet, uh, the pop-up jets, and just so cost-effective, the maintenance is easy. You know, from what you see at Beacon Park and Campus Martius, I think the, your designs actually do more than those downtown parks and in, in ways, you know, with some of the texturing and, and features. I agree with your looking into lighting and, and keeping the star dream. I didn't see where the war memorial ended up. Did that move? It's in a different spot. It's, it's in a different location. spot, which I think is a But really it's still very heavily, we are building a plaza around it or proposing But one. it's off to the right side where you have star dream to the left side, correct? Is that? For the most part, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's just so strategically great. And I just say this from watching these park spaces downtown. Um, and seeing their success. And then just my last uh, comment is just a reminder on making sure that there's budgeting uh, for programming in addition to just the park because the parks, um, the success of the park, I think is it's going to be important to have resources to create events and attractions and not just put this on there. And, uh, you know, I've actually talked to Dave and, you know, might be able to assist in some of the sponsorship aspects or branding or trying to figure out what's the tasteful way to sell aspects of it and incorporate, you know, some some corporate support where that revenue could be used for annual programming and everything. So it's just very exciting being a part of the downtown now for a couple of uh, bigger events and, and you know, just just really hats off to you guys and, and hats off to all the great comments from everyone here as well. It just it seems like a great process. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, Mr. Woods.
Is there anybody else? Yes. Yes, please. <clears throat> Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Mike Lineweber. Uh, I'm 1704 Bassett, Royal Oak. I'm also the Vice President of Construction for Central Park Development Group and Boji Group, and we're building the beautiful building right out your, your window here. Um, I am really impressed with, with the development of this park. Uh, the designs that I see are very exciting. Um, we haven't had the, the privilege of uh, sitting down with the designers, so for us, we've been kind of anxiously awaiting the opportunity to see these different kind of iterations of, of what's possible. And I really like the fact that you're seeing some different alternatives and to kind of give that input instead of one size fits all or one design and here you go. So I think it's a very positive thing uh, for the, the, the commission and the, the designers um, and the outreach to the public I think is a terrific idea. Um, a couple of comments. One is um, the area around the Star Dream Fountain, specifically as you go west from the Star Dream, there is a kind of a space in there that I think is a good opportunity to extend whatever the feeling is of the Star Dream and the park and everything else. You mentioned a gateway and an entrance way, but that is kind of a natural, you know, visual entrance way, but from the ground surface textures, I think adding that to the kind of defined area where the park designers are looking at, I think would be helpful. Um, you can see it on this uh, rendering. There's that kind of gray box, I guess, right there, and that's something that's sort of as yet undefined. Um, and I think that would be a great space that the park could sort of uh, blend you know into the city itself a little bit um, personally between the the schemes um, I like the first one um, I like it because it has a sense of serenity when it's not necessarily being used for program activities and I see that that might be you know the kind of day-to-day -day activities of families coming down I know when my boys were younger having that kind of space where they could walk around it you talk about that <coughs> ribbon kind of effect I think that would be a great thing for, for families to be able to have as their own destination. Um, uh, other, other comments, um, you know, the, the real grass versus Simlon. To me, it would be a shame to have to go to artificial turf with this. I understand it's got to work, though, and it's got to look good, and it's got to function, and you don't want to, you know, barricade it off and say this is being seeded or something else. So I understand that point, but it would be t nice if it could be real grass. Um, the last point is is budget, um, and, and Jonathan mentioned having budget for program. I worry about budget to finish what's here on the screen. So, just to be aware that that you know the designers um, can can go further than budget would allow. So at some point <laughs> those have to be reconciled. So you don't want to set expectations way up here and then start to have to take things away. So certainly budget would be an important um, thing to review as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here this evening? <clears throat> All right, seeing no one, we will close public comment. Any other comments, business before this uh, commission this evening, this task force? If not, I will accept a motion to adjourn. Motion. Motion by Frank, support by Kyle. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? This meeting's adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Yes, good job. Thank you.